I hope this morning that you will take a second, if when you get a chance, when, when you're done with communion, to say thank you to our folks that are, gonna, that are in the balcony, our handbell folks. They have led now in two services, 845 and 11. This is a service, this is a church that has three services on Sunday morning, 845 and 11 being traditional, classic, if you will, 9 o'clock being modern. This is usually the largest service of the day, but this morning we had his kids and the Sunshine Singers in the CF, the 9 o'clock service, and that today is the biggest service of the week. It was bringing in chairs until about 9.30, I believe. They were overflow. I stood over in the corner happily because there were no other seats. This is a fun time in our church and joyous time. This is a music church. I don't know if you caught the music that was being played by Mr. Quentin as you milled around and said hello to one another. Did you catch it? Easy like Sunday morning. I'll let that sit there just for a second. Mr. Quentin offered that to you Vanderbilt Commodore fans. Mm -hmm. Do you know Esty? Do you know, are you familiar with Esty? Esty is a force of nature, our children's director. She wrote out my, she wrote out my statement, my, my little speech here to give for this video that we're about to show because I don't speak in public enough. She felt like she needed to write it for me. <laughs> but my favorite part is she wrote smile at the top of it and highlighted it. That's my favorite part. I've lost it twice this morning. I'm not kidding. I've lost it twice. She has now found it twice and delivered it right here. For the third time, I thought I was walking in here going to do it on my own, but no, Miss Esty has found it and delivered it and put it in place. So please enjoy Esty's words. <laughs> Today marks the beginning of a very special time for our kindergarten through fifth graders as we kick off our faith-based milestone. This initiative is part of our commitment to nurturing the next generation in their walk with Christ. Our children's ministry is driven by a deep passion for teaching these foundational practices of our Methodist faith. Through this month's milestones, our kids will be learning about the love of God and also how to live out their faith in meaningful ways. Please enjoy this video. Good morning. This month we kick off our faith-based milestone, which marks a significant moment of spiritual growth and understanding, commitment, or practice. Rooted in John Wesley's teachings, these milestones reflect stages of development and becoming more Christ-like. Wesley emphasized means of grace, prayer, Bible study, and worship as ways to experience God's presence. Milestones serve as a key moment where individuals, especially children, actively engage in their faith journey. For our kindergarten and first graders, we're learning to pray and discover the power of the Lord's Prayer. Our kids are embracing it as their own conversation with our Creator. Our second and third graders are diving into the Bible boot camp, where they're learning Bible stories, building scripture memory, and discovering how God's word guides their daily lives through fun team building activities. And for our fourth and fifth graders, it's all about Worship 101. John Wesley taught that worship is central to our faith, and our older kids are discovering how to express their hearts to God through music, prayer, and community. Let's celebrate what God is doing through our kids. We hope you will join us in prayer as we raise the next generation of disciples right here at Smyrna First. Not only are our children's ministry staff, but our families have committed to these faith milestones. Will you join in with me just real quick to say thank you to them for that? <laughs> Exodus 3, 1 through 5. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Oreb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The road to resilience, the road map to resilience, the road to resilience. 
when, when you do sermons like this and you lay them out, you lay them out months and months in advance and you use imagery. And it was interesting that this week was a read that I was really wanting to focus on the road. Because, you know, being reverent is not something that just automatically happens. Being reverent is more than just not wearing a hat in the sanctuary. It's important to old people like me. It was funny, when I first started this, this road map, and I first started talking about it, I was putting in a relevant in there. And I realized I'd rather be reverent than relevant. And so here we are, getting ready to talk about the road map to resilience and being relevant. Meanwhile, there's imagery all around us of roads that have been washed away. Roads that in some cases are leading to nowhere because of devastation from the hurricane. Destruction. Flooding. So how do I talk about being reverent when you are covered up in imagery and videos of so much loss and suffering and hurt? You can't. You can't. I don't know if you heard, I've, I've been sick this week. I've tested negative within 48 hours and haven't had a fever in 36 hours. I'm still not feeling great, as you can tell, but I'm not contagious anymore. But I had a lot of week this time at home, which always makes the staff nervous. <laughs> but as I was reading the text and Noticing that it wasn't God first in the bush. It was an angel first in the bush. That hit me different. The Holy Spirit, as Aiden and I talked about it a minute ago, the angel, but it wasn't, it wasn't God first. I was talking with a, a lineman this week. Actually, I talked to a couple of different linemen this week. You know what linemen are, right? They work on power companies and they go out into places where they've lost. And a couple of linemen that are friends of ours, a couple of which are the age of my boys, young, young. And they're going out into communities where there's not only any power, there's not going to be power for days. And so I asked him, I said, what's that like when you get to a community and you're not going to be able to fix it? What's that like when you get there and you know that you're just there until... He said, it's hard. He said, because you walk into places and they don't have power and they haven't had it for days. They don't have running water and they see you and they see the truck and they celebrate and then you say, hey, we're just not going to have power together for a little while. He said, you sit there and you talk and he said, you, you learn to look for the power. He said, you learn to sit still. You learn to stop and to hear the birds. You learn to stop and to experience what's going on around you. And in listening to the stories and in listening to the people and showing that you care. And even though I can't fix your problem yet, I'm here and we're going to fix it. He said, you learn to listen for the power. And it's in that listening. He said, he said Derek, preacher, because he goes back and forth. He's the age of my boys. He said, I don't know what to call it. And I said, what you've been describing to me, explaining to me is what we and the church call reverence. The ability to sit still and to see bigger than us as we watch the videos of flooding, as we watch the pain and the fear and the suffering. I don't know how you don't sit and spit, sit in reverence of how you don't sit and look, and, and not only in awe and in shock, but also looking at it and going, we didn't create this. We are not the creator. We are not the sustainer. And we are deeply dependent upon the redeemer. In the altar in the world, Barbara Brown Taylor wrote, reverence requires a certain pace. It requires a willingness to take detours, even side trips, which are not part of the original plan what this young man was telling me is that when you first get there, you want to figure out how to get the power hooked up as quickly as possible. And you have to realize no matter how hard you run, no matter how fast you run, no matter how fast you think, the power will not get there until the power gets there. 
You have to be willing to sit still. You have to be willing to not do exactly, and it's exactly what Barbara Brown Taylor was saying, that we who are so type A, we who are so driven and so accomplished and so focused must at times be willing to accept a different pace, a willingness to take detours and not to hear our plan and how we are going to fix it, but what God calls us to do and how God plans to fix it. Do you know the words of the prophet? The prophet Christofferson? Because there's something in a Sunday that makes a body feel alone. And there's nothing short of dying that half as lonesome as the sound of the sleeping city sidewalk and the Sunday morning coming down. We who come in this beautiful and sacred and holy space, we who come into this sanctuary and this church surrounded by beautiful and wonderful and sacred people. If we do not stop and think of those on sidewalks and those this morning who are walking our streets wondering if anyone cares and if anyone sees them, if we can come into this space and not think of children in our community who will go to bed hungry tonight, if we can come into this space and not think of those who are suffering and who are lonely and who are afraid and wondering if the world still remembers them, if we can come into this sacred and beautiful space and not think of the hooks and the hollers of Tennessee and North Carolina and see the devastation and destruction that is all around and not stop in reverence for just a moment, then we cannot claim to be reverent, to see the brokenness around us and to know the desperate need of the Redeemer. In Disciple Bible Study last week, we were going through Moses, the burning bush, Aiden. We were going through it. And the question was asked, Derek, do you fear God? Do you fear God? And now we're going to edit this out so my United Methodist brothers and sisters won't see this part. I fear God. It's not very popular for United Methodist preachers to say because you don't want to think of God as fearful. I fear God. And let me tell you why. Because I know what happens when you're not reverent. I know what happens when you lose focus and how lonely that can feel. But I also know what happens when a congregation turns its attention to the community, turns its attention to the broken, to the lost, the last, the least, and the lost. I know how God pours his favor out upon you and blesses you with life and hope and peace and joy, and you do too. Because, brothers and sisters, that is what we sit in the midst of right now. God has been blessing us because you said children matter. Not just our children, all children. God is blessing us because you said the alien, the immigrant matters. We are going to create space for them, place for them. We are going to invest in them, pour in them, welcome them, and help them make not just a living but a life. And God has poured his blessing out upon us. And you want to know why I fear God? Because just as the blessing is poured in, if you lose focus, it can be taken out. So what could put us at risk? Two million dollars. Two million dollars can destroy it in a heartbeat if we spend our time focused on how to spend this money on what we want. If we spend our time focused on what I want, and what you want, and what our friends want, and what our Sunday school class wants. When Tracy and her team come to you, they're going to ask you, what do you think breaks God's heart in our community? When Tracy and her team gathers and asks questions and speaks to people, they're going to ask the question, what do you think it is that's breaking God's heart? Because to be reverent people is to ask ourselves the same question of, is what's breaking God's heart also breaking our heart? And if it's not, then we should fall down and cry holy because the blessing of God will soon be gone.
I am grateful for a tremendously faithful congregation. And please do not hear this as anything other than love. But at all times, over these last four years, you have poured yourself out and said, God, whatever it takes, we will follow. Do not let abundance now change us. Do not let abundance now change the heart of saying, God, whatever breaks your heart breaks ours. That, that is what it means to seek reverence. So as we leave here, I want to give you three things to do. Today, pay attention to creation. Go outside and listen to the birds. Go outside and sit still. Go outside and, and listen to the squirrel run through your yard and eat your bird food. Go outside and just be still. And what you will find is that as you are paying attention to creation, you will hear your heartbeat. And in that moment, you will know what it's like to be with God, to be reverent. As you pay attention to creation, pay attention to others. When you're at Publix or the Kroger or the Walmart or wherever you're doing your groceries, speak to the person that is checking you out. Talk to them. Pay attention to them. See them as you're going through the fast food, as you're out walking, as you're at work. To those people that you always go by too quickly, speak and pay attention to others. Everyone that you see is a child of someone a child of a mother or a father. They are someone who needs to be loved, and we cannot say we care for all bodies unless we are loving and engaging all. Say a prayer for the person for whom you are paying attention. And pay attention to the ordinary. When you're at your meal tonight, think about where the food came from. Think about where everything on your plate came from and pray for the people who made way for it to be there. And if that sounds silly to you, then start thinking about the people in Tennessee who don't know when their meals, next meal is going to come from. And they were just as comfortable as we are two weeks ago. Pray for the folks in those hooks and those hollers who don't know where their home even is today because the river and the water has carried it away. To pay attention, to be reverent, is to recognize the great gift and the blessings that are all around us. And the desperate need that lives in our souls, to share it at all times. And what makes the ordinary beautiful is the extraordinary attention. Amen? Amen.